Congress next year. So to get to the point, which is a big one today, I think we all agree there's no shortage of pressing problems and crises. We're swamped with challenges, with agendas, with solutions. How do we weigh them all? How do we prioritize this dismaying array from social injustice to economic inequality to quality of life to climate change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? We heard from Atwi about eco-apartheid. That's a big one. Quality of life's big, et cetera. You all have your favorite causes. Let's try to put them in perspective by taking a quick glance at human history. Starting at the end of the last ice age 20,000 years ago and going in great detail ever since. The ice cap melted, sea level rose much, much more than we're worried about now, uh, and the climate settled down 10,000 years ago, stable enough for us to have agriculture and for cities to emerge. We have since enjoyed almost perfect conditions for human beings to thrive, and we have thrived. Now, scientists tell us, I don't want to quote a number, but it's close to 100 percent, they agree that this halcyon summer is over. It's starting to end. It's on the move. Climate is on the move, and apparently it's accelerating. So for me, climate change is the alpha mover, the alpha challenge, the alpha driver. Not climate change per se, but its impacts. We know the litany from drought and famine to flood and sea level rise and so on. The problem is they tend to cascade and compound um, in more and more disruptive ways. Here's the difference. We've been through all sorts of inequality problems, all sorts of poverty and all sorts of moral decline and all sorts of other environmental issues as a species. This is qualitatively new. It's different. It's unprecedented. But guess what? So was sprawl unprecedented. That was an invention after World War II in America. It was unprecedented, and we whipped it. Or we, we at least here showed the way to whip it. It's pretty much a change conversation now, if not on the ground. So it can be done, and we played a big role in doing it. If we want to whip climate change, we have two of the world's leading experts on how the built environment can successfully address it. Successfully. So I'm not going to recite their illustrious bios. You can read them. But I'm going to cast them in Isaiah Berlin's famous duo of the hedgehog and the fox. Yeah. The hedgehog views the world through a single lens, a single defining idea, like Plato did, like Dante did, like Dostoevsky did. The fox draws on a wide variety of experiences, like Aristotle and Shakespeare. Every one of us is part hedgehog and part fox, depending on the context who we're talking to. You're different with your mother than you are, you know, with your colleagues, etc. Today, Ed is cast as the hedgehog and Peter the fox. <laughs> so the three of us met in the 70s, which to younger people, I mean, it, it sounds like probably the 20s does to us, the 70s to you, it's a long time ago, 40 years ago. We were all pioneering passive solar work, working together, which, by the way, the passive solar movement was also successful. It was also like this movement because it was reviving old ideas, in fact, uh, as well as new ones, just like we have. Ed is from New York. He went to college. The New York Knicks wanted him, believe it or not. He was by far the best ball player in the passive solar movement. Um, that eh, that's not saying a lot. Yeah. Um, so uh, he became an architect, a passive solar architect, had a huge impact in that field, 
And then suddenly, late in life, very suddenly, he goes national with this huge thing called the AIA 2030 movement, uh, which we'll hear more about today. He is the man on how to get to zero, especially through changes in the built environment. Peter never played college ball. Why? Because he never graduated from high school, nor college, nor architecture school. How did this totally undereducated, completely uninformed guy <laughs> do so much to get where he is, to get here today, you know, about his accomplishments? The reason is he's able to penetrate problems and come up with insights faster than anybody I have ever known. He has a real genius at doing that, at being the fox. He is a very fast fox, the fastest, in fact. So I give you a, a very powerful hedgehog and a very fast fox. We're going to start with Ed. He's going to talk, each are going to do about 25 minutes, and then we'll maybe chat a bit and then open it up. Ed. Thanks. Thank you. It's, it's, um, it's great to be here. I think I was here, I was at CNU about four or five years ago, um, uh, in Chicago, I believe. Uh, last night we were having dinner with Andres and we talked about uh, declaring victory. Um, it's actually not that, not that far off. I think 2015 is going to be a pivotal year and I think you'll see why as we talk about the road to zero. A fascinating statistic, you're all familiar, somewhat familiar with it, but I'll put it, uh, put it into context. By 2030, the next decade and a half, two decades, we will build about 80 billion square meters, that's 900 billion square feet of new and rebuilt buildings, that's tear down and rebuild, worldwide. To give you an idea of what that is, it's 60% of the entire building stock of the world today. So essentially, we're gonna re rebuild the world. Um, to put it in to a little more immediate perspective, that's the equivalent of building a New York City every 35 days, and that's all five boroughs. That's Manhattan all the way through to Queens and Bronx. If we don't get it right, we don't solve the energy and climate crisis. It's as simple as that. If we get it right, then we solve the problem. If we don't get it right, we lock in emissions and consumption patterns for 80 to 120 years. 80 years is the lifespan of a building, 120 years is all the infrastructure that goes along with it. So where is all this construction going to take place? It's actually fascinating. Very little be in Western Europe and other developed countries. The Middle East, Latin America, and India are responsible in the next decade and a half, two decades, for about 9%. Other emerging countries, mostly Southeast Asia, about 12%. The US and Canada, North America, is 15% of that total, and you all know that China is huge, and that's 38%. But what's fascinating is that the U.S. and China will be responsible for over half of all construction in the next decade and a half, two decades. And so by working together, U.S. and China, uh, we have a huge opportunity to make things right. We know where all the emissions are coming from. Urban environments, and this is just urban environments, the cities, suburbs, are responsible for 75% of all human-produced global greenhouse gas emissions. And we also know now, and this is the latest science which I'll, which I'll show you now, that in order to stay under two degrees centigrade, which is a threshold that the international community has set, the scientific community actually has set that bar a little bit lower, about 1.5 degrees. But in order to stay under two degrees C, and I'll talk about why that's important, we have to phase out all CO2 emissions from fossil fuels by the year 2050. That means zero and actually going below zero with some uptake. So this is where we are today. We're burning about 
uh, in fossil fuel emissions about 10 gigatons of carbon a year. The scientific community, IPCC, has developed four scenarios. In scenario one, which is business as usual, we just keep burning fossil fuels, slow down a little bit toward the end of the century, we'll burn through about two trillion tons of carbon. The second scenario is that we peak around 2080 and then start to drop off, we burn about one and a half trillion tons of carbon. The third scenario is we peak 2040, 2050, and then slow down, we burn over one trillion tons of carbon. The fourth scenario, which is the most important scenario, is peaking around 2020 and then phasing out all fossil fuel CO2 emissions in the power sector by about 2070 and then going negative after that. That gives us a 66% chance, a likely chance, over 50%, of staying below 2 degrees centigrade. But what the scientific community is now saying, that's a 33% chance of going over. And if we go over, it's a nightmare scenario. So those are not good odds. So they ran a fourth scenario based on that same, what they call a 2.6 um, uh, methodology. And that's peaking next year and then phasing out all CO2 and fo fossil fuel CO2 by 2050 and all greenhouse gas emissions by about 2070, 2080. That gives us a high probability of staying under 2 degrees centigrade. So that's the scenario that we want to follow. Why is that critical? We're at about 8 tenths of a degree centigrade global warming. In the first three scenarios, we go past the 2 degrees C line by about 2050. In the first scenario, it's 2040. And then the planet keeps on warming. Climate change, once we go over 2 degrees C, climate change becomes irreversible. There's so much CO2 and inertia in the, in the climate system that the planet just keeps on warming. And we can't get it back. If we limit ourselves and phase out CO2 emissions, by 2050, then we don't reach the two degrees, and because of the uptakes of oceans and, and, uh, and forestry and soils, um, we begin to bring the planet actually back to pre-industrial levels. So that's the track that we need to be on. In 2003, we published an article uh, in Metropolis Magazine and it's now uh, uh, pretty well known, and we called it the architects pollute issue. And um, it was very controversial at the time, telling architects they pollute was not an easy thing to do. But, um, it, but uh, it did resonate within about six months. Um, in 2006, we issued the 2030 targets. All new buildings, major renovations, zero carbon by 2030, designing to that standard. And it's since been adopted by the American Institute of Architects. In fact, within a month after it was issued, the AIA board adopted the targets and are now <laughs> moving to implement them. <laughs> Seventy percent of the top 20 AE firms uh, in the country and in the world have adopted the targets and are working to implement them. That doesn't mean they make it all the time, but, it, but they're now on that track. 54% of all AE firms in the U.S. have adopted the targets and are working toward it. And an amazing statistic, 63% uh, of all AE firms believe that by 2030 they will be designing carbon neutral buildings. That is a huge statistic in terms of looking, looking ahead. The federal government adopted the targets, zeroing out fossil fuels in all new buildings and major renovations by 2030. They put that into law. Congress passed it. President Bush actually signed it in 2007. Uh, and it's under attack now in the Congress, and they want to repeal it. Uh, the American Gas Association and the utilities have been pushing to repeal it because they don't want to see the federal government leading the charge to no fossil fuels. However, God bless California. Uh, they have uh, zeroing out. Uh, zero net energy by, t by 2020 in all new residential buildings uh, and by 2030 in all new commercial buildings, and they're pretty hell-bent on meeting those targets. 
Many cities and states and counties have stepped up to the plate and adopted some form or another of these 2030 targets. We've been educating architects all around the country in a series called the AI Plus 2030 series. It's now running in 27 markets across the United States on how to actually meet these targets. And uh, some architects in Seattle, architects and planners in Seattle, just unknown to us, called us and said, we want to start a 2030 district, meeting your 50% district-wide targets and your zero for new buildings and major innovations. They started a 2030 district in Seattle. It is, it is spreading like wildfire all throughout the, the U.S. and now in Canada. Um, and Albuquerque actually, a few days ago, just announced there, went public with their 2030 district. It takes quite a while to get to 2030 district status, and you have to just sign a charter and all sorts of things. Uh, and now we have cities all across the U.S. now in various stages of forming 2030 districts. So what are these 2030 districts? They're private sector-led initiatives. They're not public sector or government-led initiatives. It's the private sector that gets together and says, we're going to meet these targets. We want to get ahead of the curve, and we want to set policy, not have it imposed on us. So the property owners get together with service stakeholders like utilities, uh, other kinds of service stakeholders within the community, and then community stakeholders like, for example, architects, local governments, uh, and other uh, nonprofit organizations, housing organizations, and they form a partnership. And then they agree to meet a 50 by 2030 district-wide reduction target in building energy consumption, fossil fuel energy consumption, water consumption, and transportation emissions. And we've now added a fourth target, which is called resiliency, meaning they look what the projections are, they look at what the projections are in their community, in their district, and then they set goals and targets to alleviate those, those, um, th those um, uh, conditions. So how do we get to zero? We say it's a two-step process. Step one is what we call information. Step two is what we call technology. Step one actually gets us 70 to 80% of the way there. This is low cost, no cost. This is what you know and, and how you understand the issues and how you're able to plan and design. Step two is adding technology to get you the rest of the way there. Step one is everything from regional transit planning to district boundaries and city boundaries to local transit, to walkable communities, to buildings, and all the way down to building elements. It's the whole nine yards connected up so that planning isn't divorced from architecture, isn't divorced from products. It's all one new way of doing things, essentially one new language. And once we get down 60, 70, 80 percent of the way there, then we add renewables, everything from site scale renewables all the way to district scale renewables and neighborhood scale renewables to utility scale renewables, wind, solar, biomass, geothermal. We started a, uh, an ambitious project of gathering all this information in both planning and architecture across all scales and putting it into what we call the 2030 palette. It's free, it's online, and it's continually being developed out. So the initial palette is now there. It consists of 53 or 54 different issues, from regional issues through city town issues, through site issues, and then through building issues and building element issues. We call them swatches. It's a palette. Each swatch is then developed separately online. Um, it consists of a rule of thumb or a guideline to solve that particular issue. And again, this gets you in the ballpark. And so, for example, uh, this element, this swatch is called solar shading. There are examples of south side shading or north side if you're in the southern hemisphere from all regions around the world. And then it gives you a rule of thumb. So, for example, this shot was taken in, uh, in July, August in Bainbridge Island, Islandwood and um, 44 degrees north latitude. And essentially it says, if you project out half the height of the opening, you'll shade that glazing in the summertime. 
So here's the height of the opening in Islandwood, again taken in late July. That's X is the height, that's half X, and you can see that the shading is glade, glade is um, uh, shaded. If you know that one particular rule of thumb when you're designing, then you are in the ballpark. You can then adjust it slightly depending upon computer models and things like that. But this gets you probably 80, 90 percent of the way there. Uh, there are also in-depth information pages. We only have about five or six swatches that have those. Uh, and then there are tools and resources where we link out to what we can find, the best resources that we think are available, and this keeps continually getting updated. So those are links out to what people are doing. Uh, I want to touch on this one because Doug is writing a paper on, um, uh, on heat island mitigation. And so there is a swatch, Doug, on heat island mitigation. It has three or four rules of thumb. Uh, one rule of thumb is about tree canopy. How do you reduce heat island mitigation? So, for example, if you increase your tree canopy by 10% within a district or a city, you can reduce midday high air temperatures by about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. That is huge when we begin talking about that issue, uh, you know, especially with old people, people who work outdoors all the time, landscapers, stuff like that. This becomes an important element. So have we made any progress, and why have we even been talking about declaring victory here? In the U.S., in the building sector, the U.S. used about 40 quads of energy in 2005. So this is quads of energy. It's just a unit of energy, quadrillion BTUs, a big number. So in 2005, we used about 40 quads of energy. That was documented. And in 2005, the federal government, the DOE EIA, projected that we would need about 43 percent more additional energy by the year 2030, that we're going up almost 45 degrees in terms of energy consumption. And every year they do this same projection based on the latest statistics and analysis and project out into the future. This was 2007. This is before the recession. It had come down. The building sector was getting more efficient. We actually leveled out a little bit, and uh, the projections were we weren't going to go up as much. Then we had the recession. There was a big drop. About half of that drop was due to the recession. The other half it w was due to more efficiency gains in the building sector. Now the recession is built into the model. So that was 2009, just about the end of the recession. In 2000. 11, we actually leveled out, went down some to 2011, and then the projections were not as steep. 2013, we went down even more. Now, by 2013, we added 20 billion square feet to our building stock, and our emissions in the U.S. still went down in energy consumption. And the projections were almost flat, and now we have the 2014 numbers. We're actually getting closer to 2015 numbers in another month or two. Uh, but we're basically flat between 2005 and 2030, business as usual. So this is not doing anything else that, that we're doing now. We, we don't need any more new power plant capacity in the U.S. For the next, nobody's building new capacity. You might take down a plant here, build one here, but basically we have a market-based moratorium on power plant capacity in the United States. They ran another... They ran another statistic, and that was, what if we just use the best available demand technology that we have now? Better lighting, better envelope design, better insulation, better glazing, stuff like that. Not even design. And we go down again. So this is how far we've come. But here's the fascinating thing. You know, everybody's saying, oh, well, we're going to have to change our lifestyle. It's going to cost us a fortune to make these changes and all this kind of stuff, and we can't do it. From 2005 to 2013, the American consumer, this is distributed across the entire United States, in little cities and towns and everywhere, have saved $560 billion from what they were expected to pay in 2013 to what they actually paid in 2013. $560 billion, that's the whole bailout that Congress approved. If you want to know why the economy is doing so well, it's because people have more disposable income. The actual savings now in business as usual 
which is why the utilities are freaking out a bit these days, is $4.61 trillion that they don't get. And if we, if we just adopt best available demand technology, it's another $1.83 trillion. And if we do best planning practices and architecture design practices, that goes down even more. We took that message to the OECD and the UNFCCC in Bonn and in Paris this past year, and they were stunned at what was going on in the U.S. Everybody thought everything was going on in Europe, nothing was happening in the U.S., and the U.S. was holding everyone back. We delivered the message, and the whole thing turned around on a dime. We then issued, at those conferences, the roadmap to zero emissions, with actually the U.S. in a leadership role. Since that time, there was a every third year meeting by the global architecture community, all the chapters from all over the, the world, representing 1.3 million architects. We sent a pledge with the AIA to that meeting, and it was adopted unanimously, the first time in the history of the UIA that they adopted something without one dissent. Every country in the world was represented, and that was phasing out CO2 emissions in the built environment by the year 2050. <laughs> and since then, after that OECD meeting and Paris meeting, over 120 nations called for zero fossil fuel emissions by the second half of the century, some by 2050, some by 2070, some by 2100. But at that last OECD meeting in Lima, bishops from all continents called for phasing an end to the fossil fuel era. Get rid of it altogether, and the Pope is now going to issue an encyclical calling for all Catholics to work on ending fossil fuel emissions. The head of the World Bank called for zero net emissions. The head of the OECD called for zero net emissions. The USDN and Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance now has 17 in the Cities Alliance globally, and I think the USDN is now working close to up to 20, 30 cities, now pledging either 80 by 50 reduction in greenhouse gas emissions or zero uh, by 2050. Uh, the EU set its interim goal at 40 percent. California just followed the EU uh, this past week with a 40 percent by 2030 goal and then 80 to 95 percent emissions cut by 2050. And this morning I got up and read the news and the Church of England now is selling all fossil fuel investments <laughs> following the leadership of the, of the Catholic Church and um, uh, calling it a moral responsibility to get out of fossil fuels. We were contacted by the mayor's uh, office and a task force that was set up by de Blasio before um, uh, Climate Week last year. Uh, 71 to 75 percent of all emissions in New York City comes from buildings. So they asked us how would we phase out buildings, how can we, what kind of target can we get? Uh, we illustrated how they can get to an 80 percent reduction by 2050 in New York City with buildings leading the way at a 91 percent. We since put that into an urban climate initiative for any city and the way you do it with cities is you've got to get at the existing building stock. There's 5.75 billion square feet of building in New York City. And uh, the way you do that is at building sale. There's a lot of money changing hands, and you then require the upgrades at that particular point in time. And now I want to finish up. I was asked to talk to a whole group of scientists, the National Science Foundation, uh, and uh, I was giving a keynote speech to scientists, and I was wondering, what am I going to tell them? So I said, you guys uh, recently sent a probe out to an outer space, took years to get there, went to Saturn, and you actually guided it through the rings of Saturn, took measurements and photographs, and sent that back to Earth. Now, Saturn's moving. I mean, uh, how you send it through the rings of Saturn and actually pinpoint it is amazing. And I said uh, to the scientific community, I said, I'm going to give you another problem. You solved that problem. I want to give you another problem. This is a very difficult problem now. This is how much solar energy falls on each square foot of surface 
So this is distributed free. We don't have to dig anything up. We don't need machinery. We don't have to destroy the planet. We don't have to burn anything. This is distributed free to every place on the planet. So I'm going to take four completely different cities and areas in the U.S. Seattle, which is probably the cloudiest climate in the U.S. or probably the world. Uh, Chicago, Albuquerque, and Atlanta. For those of you who are lucky to live in Seattle. Uh, and I'm going to show you how much energy falls on a roof per square foot in thousands of BTUs a square foot. That's the scale. And how much falls on the south face. So this is how much energy falls on the roof, one square foot, or horizontal surface, in those four cities. Seattle, about 400,000. Uh, uh, Albuquerque, about 650,000. This is how much falls on the south face per square foot, almost as much as on the roof. Close. About 350,000 in, in, uh, in Seattle and then uh, probably 500,000 in, in uh, Albuquerque. Okay, so now this is how much energy consumption a typical, this is a typical leaky old house in the U.S. needs a year per square foot of floor area. Same square foot to square foot. 42,700 BTUs a square foot a year. In a typical commercial institutional building, the average is 85,000. If you build those buildings to code today, it's about half that amount. So th that's the average, and you build it about half that amount. So this is the problem I gave to the scientific community. I said in Seattle, this is how much energy you get on the roof per square foot of any area in, in Seattle. And that's how much energy you get on the south face per square foot of south face or south wall. And then I said, let's throw in the east and west face just for good measure. It's actually quite a bit falls on the east and west face. So that's how much energy you get on the roof and three sides of a building in Seattle. Worst case, this is the worst case condition. And I said, this is how much energy a typical US building needs to operate per square foot, same square foot, thousands of BTUs a square foot a year. So I said, raise your hand if you can't solve this problem. <laughs> you just sent a spacecraft through the rings of Saturn, and this is the most pressing problem on the planet. So this is the fascinating part, and this we, we will send you out thinking why we said possibly victory. This is energy price, uh, electricity, coal, natural gas, uh, adjusted for inflation, about 50 to $75 a, gig, a gigajoule. Back when we were practicing solar energy costs in 1980, $1,100 a gigajoule. It was a fortune back then, and we were still trying to use it and everything else. Now I want to, I want to fast forward to today. This is the price of generating electricity from solar energy. It is now at parity today with fossil fuels. And that's not going to bounce back up, by the way. That's going, keeps going down. And again, just yesterday, Elon Musk comes. They now have battery packs for homes that they're going to just stick on the wall six inches thick to store all that energy that you generate. This is the game changer. So. In finale, in 2001, 81% of our new generation on an annual basis was, gold, was coal, gas, nuclear, and oil, and 19% was renewable. So I'm going to put that in motion now. In 2013, that changed. There's more new capacity being built now in renewables than there are in fossil fuels, including <laughs> nuclear. And with battery storage, it's a game changer. That thing is going to drop, and the other is going to disappear, actually. Thank you.
boy, I mean, 40 years, and you finally came up with something. I mean, <laughs> he is a hedgehog, you know? He just kind of went at it slowly, got all the pieces lined up, and then when he came out, he really came out strong. And we haven't seen him for a while either. He really has been operating below the surface. It's true, Ed. <laughs> Anyway, let me go at the same thing with a uh, slightly different angle. Um, you know, I've been working mainly, first of all, I want to say, I am happy to be back at CNU. You guys look, I mean, that dance party last night was fabulous, and uh, the new faces are fabulous, mainly because I can show old stuff and they all think it's new. But there's a bunch of old folks in the front here who will, can leave now, because you've already seen this stuff. Um, but no, it just feels exciting. And with Lynn running us, a new person, new face, no baggage, no history, new vision, new energy, this is really, uh, I'm back into it. I, I'll probably come again, who knows? Anyway, so let me get on with this stuff. Thinking about carbon, you, you, there is the kind of, the numbers and the inevitability and the need but there's the politics. How do we get there in terms of convincing people? There's a lot of people who just are in deep denial. There's a lot of money that's in deep denial. There's a lot of what they call stranded assets, which is infrastructure and uh, uh, oil own ownership and things like that that are, want to be in denial and are paying a lot of political dollars to remain in denial. Um, we tend to see it this way, which is, COT by country, and you know, everybody's happy now that there's a new villain on the planet, which is China, not us. But the reality, of course, is if, whoops, well, these slides aren't gonna work. Um, there's a map of the world behind this, and <laughs> 23, uh, 23 uh, tons per capita is US, 10 per capita is Europe, four, which is actually now rocketed it up to seven, is China, and two is India and the third world. So when you look at it on a per capita basis, the real villains are still the wealthy of the planet and the, and the uh, people who spend too much uh, um, on, on the wrong kind of lifestyle, the wrong kind of cities. Now, how do these people spend it? And globally, buildings, as Ed is focused on more, is a big, component, transportation less. But those two together, around 60% of, of the carbon problem is urban. It's the urban form, it's the buildings, it's the things we deal with. As the, as the society gets wealthier, interestingly enough, as California shows, it gets to be more about transportation. Because actually fixing the buildings is easy to do, should be done, and in California, we started back in the first Brown administration with Title 24. We set energy standards, and lo and behold, our buildings are not a big problem anymore, and that actually proves the point. What Ed says is, well, now we should just do that everywhere. So, but the transportation one is the one that, on some level, new urbanism focuses a little bit more on, which is how do people move around in their city? What kind of uh, physical environment is there? But a third way of looking at carbon and emissions is by income class. So who really is the problem here? And when you look at, the, along the x-axis is the po global population, on, on the y-axis is, uh, the vertical axis is tons of uh, carbon per capita. And the upper income, of course, is where the issues are. The upper income are the people who live in cities. Half the global population still lives in the countryside. They are not the problem, they are also poor. They're a problem on that level. There's a pro great global problem. But in terms of carbon emissions, this is not their burden to solve. It's cities and middle class. And what it really raises the question of, what does it mean to be middle class in 2050? What is, what is the definition of that? To a certain degree, America has defined that for the world over the last 40 years. And China, everybody aspires to the American version of middle class. And that's why what we do here shifts the dialogue around the planet. If you want to get to where IPCC says we should be at 2050, the upper income groups have to come down to around three tons of carbon per capita. And just like Ed, I'll say, actually, no problem. Today, Sweden, 
um, is around 4.8. It's not a big step to go down to three per capita. Um, California today is around 10, but our new laws mandate where we will be, and we have demonstrated how we can get there, will be down at around 3.3. So California will actually demonstrate what the, na the international wealthy have to do in order to get there. So as I've been working overseas, I began to realize quite quickly that, you know, the kind of sprawl that we're confronting in the U.S. isn't the same problem, doesn't have the same configuration, doesn't have the same ratios or strategies that the rest of the world have. So I've come up with a very simple three sprawl uh, uh, taxonomy for global cities. One is low, low density sprawl, which of course is U.S. It's also middle class sprawl. You all know we, the wealthy and the middle class left the city. The second is low income sprawl. Most of Latin America, Africa, India puts the low income population at the periphery at fairly low densities and in inaccessible locations. And that sets up a whole nother dynamic of des urban design challenges. And the third kind of sprawl is fairly unique to China, which is high density sprawl. It has density, it doesn't have urbanism, it's dysfunctional in the worst of all possible. If you thought low density sprawl was bad, wait till you see high density sprawl. It's just um, writ large. So can we, and we need to find urban solutions to all three. And we've done a good job here at CNU in defining those solutions for one of the three urban typo global urban typologies. And I think at some point we all need to move on to start thinking about the other two. But uh, in California, in the United States, I don't need to even, with this group, go through the litany of issues. And I think a lot of you have seen our Vision California um, analysis, which says how do we get to three tons of carbon per capita by 2050 in the state? And I'll run through it because what happens in these two scenarios, business as usual versus smart growth, is of course is that we can demonstrate not just carbon as a metric that motivates people or that changes the daily economics or the civic economics uh, or the uh, commercial economics of the place, but a whole range of other factors. And I don't think we can win this just based on carbon, climate change, energy conservation. There are just too many people who have more some more real pressing agendas, others more deflecting agendas, but there's a lot of agendas out there. And the good news, of course, is that we solve all of them. Land conservation, agricultural uh, productivity in California, the difference is phenomenal, smart growth to um, uh, uh, business as usual. Infrastructure costs, this is where the conservatives in government get on board. Less infrastructure costs, less O&M, costs, higher revenues. This is, I think, something that Peter Katz has been uh, clarifying. Uh, the, the economics of a city uh, get better. Uh, now, there are city council people who don't really give a shit about climate change, and they, don't, and they don't want to, and they don't want to believe it even exists. But when they look at these kind of numbers, they get on board, and they're with us as well. And so this is the really important matter of coalition building. VMT is about daily life, as you all know, and carbon, and congestion, and imperv impervious surface, and on and on and on. We now have a, a pretty sophisticated models that allow us to get these numbers fairly easily at a regional and local scale, and also map it. This, of course, is VMT per household by place in LA. It's obvious where that is. Now, this is one, one of my points of insertion on, uh, you know, the uh, sprawl retrofit. Yes, we have to do it. By the way, in LA, there's, uh, there, there's little else to do. Um, you know, there's not much of a city there to begin with. We just have to make cities throughout this vast metropolis. Uh, building energy, this is without any of Ed's solar or uh, sun angles or anything like that. So this is just more compact buildings with smaller surface area. On top of this, this is the 70, 80% you do while you're asleep uh, if you're headed towards smart growth. On top of this, you then add the technology and the intelligent design. So huge amount of savings there. Water couldn't be a bigger issue than it is today. And hand in hand with climate change, it'll become more and more so. And we solve that as well. So this confluence of all these issues um, 
is what gives us, I think, political momentum to create new coalitions, and coalitions are what build uh, a political change. Uh, activity related, you know, walkability, all these things, health costs, I mean, the, all these factors come together. And then finally, affordability. We had a crash in 08, I think, because the average middle class household couldn't afford the American dream, fundamentally. They couldn't afford the, the size of the house, the size of the yard, the distance of the travel every day. And with, with our kind of future, um, that $10,000 a year of savings is huge. That's 20% in today's dollars of the average household income. So if we care about social equity, affordability, and the well-being of, of, uh, of lower income populations, this is also key. So we are able to hit here in the U.S. or in what I call the low density sprawl world uh, enough targets to actually move the dial dramatically. California's SB 375 and um, uh, AB 32 carbon law, we were asked to actually do an analysis of you know, where we can go and how we can get there. The do nothing trend, these are just buildings and travel, which in California are 75% of energy. And you'll note buildings are pretty small, travel remains big. With smart growth, these numbers are cut in half. So that's the simple first step and it's the affordable and coalition building one. Vehicle efficiency cuts that, uh, the red bar in half again, low carbon fuels gets us down to something very close to 20% of 1990. I mean, um, building efficiency, this is actually where I need Ed's help, and he's gonna come into California and help with this, which is there's a lot of pre-Title uh, 24 buildings left that are leaky and unhealthy, and the question is how do you, revitalize and, and change those. Renewable power, we're at 30% renewable in the por energy portfolio in California. If we go to 60%, we come down a bit. It's, you know, interestingly, when you put in perspective, all that shifting, all that discussion about uh, moving from, uh, from fossil fuel to renewables in the energy sector really doesn't move the dial nearly as much as good urbanism. And this is the goal. So you can see actually our deficit is those old buildings. That's the one thing we've still got to tackle. And of course in LA, every region in the state has to do a sustainable community strategy uh, which meets targets for reduced VMT and it's changed the game throughout. Uh, of course transit has become the backbone and the growing armature of, uh, of, of Southern California as an example, and that's our high-speed rail system, which is actually a key, not just getting north to south, but bringing the Central Valley into the larger economy and fundamentally becoming the backbone regional transit system for something as large as Southern California. And so, once again, with sprawl retrofit, please, debate was ridiculous. This is, this is what we have to do. Uh, and the idea that we can only do one thing at a time is really insulting to me. I mean, you, the, you know, we've, we've always wanted to do 20 things at once. So this, of course, LA is investing in transit, and then, of course, this is the future. And nobody will stand up and protect that strip, and there's too much of it. Okay, the next urban typology. Uh, Mexico, we just completed a regional plan there. And this is where the low income population has been pushed to the periphery, either in social housing above or informal uh, housing below, but they're all way beyond the boundaries of the city. 30% of households have a car in Mexico City, and yet they're at gridlock. 70% of the population don't own a car. It's a totally different design problem than what we have. They do walk to local destinations, they have to. Their biggest problem is how to get to work because they're in, not in healthy, proximate locations. And as organic and wonderful as it would sound, the uh, bus system, colectivos or private buses, they stop everywhere for anybody because every time they pick somebody up, they make a little bit of money. So the stops and starts create a nightmare of inefficiency. The transit system is really dysfunctional. Now this is where the wealth is. It's all downtown not in the suburbs. This is where the jobs are. It's all downtown where the wealthy are and they have easy access. Uh, this is our beginning mappings of the region. We, we basically broke the region into uh, four categories. There's either a place where you're 
close to jobs and you have decent transit, or which is the um, which is this core area. Uh, then there's places that are close to jobs but without transit. There are places with transit but no jobs. And then there's this two-thirds of the population that have nothing, have no accessibility. So this is the design problem here. Then we also looked at the urban form within that accessibility model. And so uh, there's basically this, the two ac axes here are density and, and scale of street network walkability effectively. So the best of both happens in the dark green. Just walkable but not dense is in uh, the light green and you can see that we've created this taxonomy. 58 percent actually is decent urbanism. I mean and once again it's largely driven because um, in those places people without cars pretty much demand walkable neighborhoods. I mean it's a, it's a given. Um, so here's where you are. When you take that matrix and understand it, uh, the best walking environment and density uh, combined with the best access is only 10% of the population. So this leads us to framing the problem and working on the issue. And then, of course, we did our metric analysis that allowed us to look at the whole range of, of types, created scenarios uh, of different growth patterns, expanding transit, infilling affordable housing, uh, shifting job centers, the whole range of meta strategies. Uh, and then the metric analysis, not unlike California, where the players get to see all the different impacts of these different futures. And once again, the politics start to line up in a totally new way, from a log jam to uh, a lot of movement forward. This is still early in this process, so I can't really report out the uh, the end result. So the final typology is high density sprawl. And if you think we had it bad, these are 500 meters blocks. I mean, that's a quarter mile to get to the intersection. And when you put streets on, eight, uh, on quarter mile centers, every street is at least six to eight lanes. And so the walkability in China is gone. Furthermore, uh, you know, Ed, this is perfect solar orientation. Uh, Feng Shui in China says everybody faces south, and they do. And so uh, potentially these are great passive solar buildings, but um, sometimes too much of a good thing. I mean, it's really a, a scary environment to go through. And the speed and the efficiency with which they build means that it's all placeless. Placeless walk in, uh, in places that you can't walk in. It's tragic. And of course, in Beijing, it's about 26% of households have cars, and yet they're at complete gridlock. They're on their seventh ring road because the first six didn't work. They think the seventh one will work. I mean, it's beyond absurd, um, but that is the definition of insanity. Um, and of course, now, from a city dominated by pedestrians and bikes, you take your life in your hands when you try to move around on foot. But more so, the real motivator for China isn't climate change, it's air quality and the health impacts. They're at a point now where people can no longer work in Beijing. And so what I keep coming back to is that we need to have a full range of motivators, not just climate change as the one. This is what's really making them change. So years ago, four years ago, Energy Foundation invited us to come in and make some proposals about urban form. And the national government in China said, we like these ideas, but we want to test them before we adopt standards around these concepts of new urbanism and transit-oriented development. So they gave us six cities to work in. And each one, I'll show you briefly, were um, very significant projects. By the way, this is the percent of GDP for uh, mortality from air quality impacts. In China, it's 12% of their GDP. So on your graphs where you show the money saved on energy, you can also say, show lives saved, lives saved uh, because of these strategies. Uh, I have more of this. It, it's fascinating. So here's a super block, and here's the environment within. Actually, nobody lives on the ground floor, so they're empty. No shops, nothing. No sidewalks. It's beyond absurd. These are the super blocks as built. 
Uh, and we were actually asked to redesign this area. It was already under construction, already had a grid. Uh, and so we went from that, which is a literal map, uh, to this. That's actually the same amount of asphalt and the same built up area as the previous map, just urbanism instead of uh, super blob. In Chongqing, this is a small city of 30 million people. It's, it's a city the size of California in population. In the southern part, it's the historic center, and the study area, small study area they gave us is planned for four and a half million people in growth. We started by introducing an idea that they never thought of, which is to study the uh, natural environment before you start planning the area. Um, because their attitude was always just the bulldozers will take care of it. It's very hilly terrain. So we massed off and preserved the key repairing corridors and uh, topographic areas. It still leaves a lot, and unfortunately, I don't know if you can turn down the light so we can see this. This is the, the built environment. They've already put in the freeways. They, you know, the freeways always go first in China, so, so it's kind of sad. The dashed are the ones that aren't quite done. So th those are the design givens, the natural environment and the built environment. This is the end result. We call these uh, transit-oriented districts, which are areas that are potentially walkable, and within them, TODs, based on what is the most phenomenal investment in uh, metro systems. I mean, they're, they're, they are really building transit, and they get that transit is the key. What we tried to show them is, your growth should be organized around the transit, not the freeways. This is one little test site that we were given, um, ULI. It, it had a plan for super blocks, isolated uses, and we redesigned it into a, a walkable grid with auto-free streets. And of course, we were able to save the whole riverfront as common open space. And every, every highlighted street in there is an auto-free street. Now, here we are. Uh, CNU doesn't like auto-free streets, but when you go to countries where only 20 to 30 percent of people have cars, auto-free streets make all the sense in the world, and there were transit. Right? So we got to recalibrate our standards when we go somewhere else. Same with, of course, high-rise. High-rise is a good thing if it's handled properly, i.e. focused around metro. Um, and so that's what this particular community looks like with its uh, green green edges. Uh, and this is the transit center uh, where the dreaded one-way couplet emerges. Um, <laughs> as the road comes off, the freeway turns into a more civil three-lane facility that people can actually get across. Uh, but the focus is on the transit center. And a couple more minor projects. This was about uh, 1.5 million population uh, in in uh, Xiamen, in Kuming, uh, another one. This is actually that site that was, was super blocks and we redesigned it. And once again, the dreaded couplet. This, this green space down the middle had already been planned as a 12 lane arterial. And so what we did was we said, no, no, you can actually put the cars out here and converted all the parks and buses. So this is no cars and the cars are at the periphery and this is the framework there and they actually are building that. Zhuhai, this is an area the size of San Francisco. So these are small experiments that are being made. Um, the end result is, and I think we're, am I out of time? No, I'm not. I'm gonna go through this. We developed, and you can't see the, uh, yeah, you can, uh, a, a series of very simple standards. And each one of these red lines actually has numbers to it, design standards. And we have now been invited by uh, Mohert, which is the, the HUD equivalent in China to write design standards, not guidelines, standards that will be national on all of these features that I'm about to go through. So eight, and you know, the tradition of writing a charter, the, the commandments, I mean, it really goes over well in China. They like this kind of thing. <laughs> you know, this, thou shalt do this, 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 and this, and buy the book. Um, bike networks. Net, dense networks. Now this is the most controversial, the biggest lift there, because the developers and the cities were really used to delivering land. And remember, the city is the horizontal developer. He's the big land use client. And then they sell the land, they lease 50 year and 70 year leases to private developers to build the vertical stuff. 
So the developers are used to getting a, a 500 meter block and then the cities are used to laying it out that way because it's quick and cheap. So going to this more complex network really has been uh, the biggest sticking point. But of course, it's at the heart of creating a decent urban environment. We can't do it any other way. And I think we've won that battle. Um, they already do this, high, high quality transit, and it varies from BRT, amazing BRT systems, to Metro. Uh, the idea of bringing back mixed use actually isn't a big reach. Most of the residential blocks do have small scale retail, but they are getting the affliction of shopping malls. Uh, and, and so the, you know, between the super blocks and the shopping malls, uh, we had our two biggest battles, which is to distribute retail in ways that uh, are really accessible again. Uh, density to transit. For them, density is equal everywhere, you know, and it's a minimum. And actually, because of their fixation on solar access, they have very rigorous solar access laws. The maximum FAR is around three uh, in order to get the building spacing to a point where, and they have rules where, e you know, X percent of windows on every unit have to get X number of hours of sun per year. Well, when you do that, you end up with an interesting maximum. But you also end up with taller buildings that are spaced more, and therefore, how, you f how do you fill out the urban form between those buildings? Very interesting design problems. But the idea of actually varying the density towards the transit is, was a new idea. And the, they, they now get that and are uh, with it. As they build new regions, the connectivity and the jobs, housing balance is key. This comes straight out of all of our work on regional planning, that these are the two key elements to make a healthy region. And then, um, just to tag along with that, a whole you know, grab bag of energy efficient strategies. The technology that we add, the 30% at the bottom of your slide coming up there. So I will say, in closing, success. And I, but I, you know, I keep saying it's time to declare victory and move on. Well, I've changed my mind. We should keep going just as we were. On the, on the left, or on, on your left, Better Growth, Better Climate is a new report from WRI, which everybody should download and read. It's the first time that a major climate change entity has framed the issue and said cities are the most important technology we have to fix. And it's the first time that it's actually been part of the menu of strategies to deal with climate change. And they are very well respected and very powerful. So for the first time, urbanism is now on the table, which has been a huge frustration to me. And then in China, as I mentioned before, Transit-Oriented Development in China, this is a book that we recently published, but the design standards are, are being put into place. So onward and forever upward. Thank you. <laughs>